Hello everybody and welcome to Handmade Hero. Sure, we could a complete game live on stream. Uh, we are, we've got sort of two things we got to do. We're going to do one this weekend and then I think next week I'm going to do the other. So the first thing we got to do uh, is finish up the art, uh, the different style art markup that I wanted to do that would just allow us to not change the file names that the artists supply. Um, I hadn't really thought about it until I got to that point, but <clears throat> once I got to that point, I was like, this is probably how we want to do things. Uh, and the other thing we got to do is do a four coder demo of the new four coder system. I'm going to leave that till next weekend, uh, especially because I kind of want a little bit more time to break myself in on the new four coder. Uh, I only just kind of finished up my fairly massive changes to it. So on this machine, we're still going to be using basically the same as the old four coder was. Uh, for this weekend and then we'll uh, switch next weekend we'll probably do like one of the streams we'll just be a, a demo talking about like how all the new design of everything in four coder works now and so that people aren't confused about what I'm doing on stream and like how the editors work it because it's a pretty big departure now uh, with the way that I've set everything up so uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started on the parsing stuff, and we'll try to get that finished up this weekend, or at least to a good stopping point. And then next weekend, I think maybe we'll try to, to go ahead and change over, uh, and we'll go from there. There'll be a little bit of learning curve, even for me, because like I've made some pretty massive changes, and I rebound several keys uh, in the process and sort of changed the way some basic things are, are happening, uh, just to be like more powerful now. But they, you know, everything takes muscle memory a little bit of time to actually get correct, so... We'll see. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need a little bit of a decompression on that. Uh, but for right now, we're going to stick with the same four coders. We should, uh, shouldn't have much uh, problem today uh, with that sort of stuff. So uh, let me go ahead and switch up to Handmade Hero and just build, uh, give you a quick reminder of where we were at. So, you know, building Handmade Hero here, if you remember where we let, ended up last weekend, we actually wrote a complete parser uh, for our tag file format which is in the handmade tags directory uh, looks like this uh, and this these are the two ones and essentially what this is is uh, we just decided look let's let the artist leave the file names the same as they were since we know we have to parse a text file or some other markup information anyway to put things in here like the alignment points we might as well just put them all in one text file and that way the artists don't have to worry more about that they just save stuff out and then we come in here and say look whatever you named it we don't care we'll just say that whatever it was is this you know set of tags and that way we can just control the whole process separately and we don't have to do anything else about it furthermore and this is really more the reason why I liked this better is now inside the handmade directory there's just a tags directory that has these things in it I can push that to source code control and out to, to you folks in the zip file uh, for people who pre-order the game and build the source at home. Uh, that way that can be updated continuously, but the art, which takes up a lot more room, right? Because especially imagine this director is going to have like 10 times this number of pings in it probably eventually. Um, nobody wants to keep downloading that, right? You don't want to have to keep dealing with that nonsense. So instead what we did is we split it out and we said, okay, the art directory is going to get nixed. Tags will be here. And then this sources directory will just have all the stuff in it that we need uh, to build, right? You can kind of see all that stuff uh, in here. Okay. So uh, what I want to do now is sort of expand on that concept. I want to get this stuff parsing and I want to try and start the, the process of building HHAs from nothing using just these text files and there's only one thing i think that will stand in our way of that uh, and that's fonts and that's fine uh, we can address fonts next weekend after the four coder situation uh, so we can really focus on on stuff other than that now the other thing i did and i and this is another thing that um again just part of getting things to a, a completion state so we can really kind of say all right, this is how it's done, and we can just move on. We don't have to worry about it anymore. Is I also got uncompressed versions of all of the layers for our cutscenes here. 
Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put those into the uh, into the the intro cutscene directory. And I don't know exactly how we want to organize them per se, uh, possibly by shots. Uh, it doesn't really matter. But point being, uh, this gives us another way to sort of test out this system uh, and see how it's going to be. So in the intro cutscene, you know, we've got the art here, we've got the the title screen, uh, and we've got all of these like layers here. Uh, I don't like if you look here into shot two, uh, you can see that they're all named like layer one layer two layer three so the problem with it is you know i could make subdirectories here but these names are not unique and i would really prefer it if the names were unique so otherwise i'd start differentiating in my tags files so i don't know that we really want to do that uh, i'm fine with requiring the artist to make these names be unique from now on uh, and so that we don't have to talk about some uh, long directory path to say which layer one ping you mean uh, when you're drawing something or whatever, right? Uh, so what I'd like to do here is just make some way of, of, of you know, moving these guys in here that, that makes sense. And so what I'm thinking is maybe I can just prepend this name to it, right? So, you know, if I've got something like this, I don't actually know if you can, I think you can do something like this where, you know, all of these have layer uh, underscore one in front of it. Uh, but I think you can just do something like this where you just do shot 11 underscore, right? Um, and I think all of these rename, no, I guess they don't. So I thought there was a way to do that. Let me double check to see, um, there are certainly renaming utilities we could use, but I thought you could actually uh, change this. Let me see if that's true. So if I go into, uh, oops, if I, don't get blocked by the start bar. Uh, if I go into um, users Casey desktop, or sorry, user Casey, what is it? Ah, C colon users Casey desktop. Uh, and I go into that opening directory. If I go into shot 01, I feel like inside here, if I do a rename, I can actually uh, do, let me see. Uh, I thought there was a way to rename multiple at a time. Let me just see if, if I'm wrong. So if I do rename layer star as shot uh, 01 star, what happens? Uh, so it doesn't, I'm so confused. I swear this was something that Windows used to be able to do. I know everyone who uses Unix is laughing right now because Windows is so bad at this and you're not wrong, but I thought they had a way of doing just this one operation and I can't remember what it was, but that you could actually rename things while keeping part of the file name intact. Um, but I'll be darned if I can remember what it is. Give me one more chance. All right, let me search. I'm so shy. Am I just dreaming? Oh, it's just because the star, it's the star. Okay, I, see, see, I'm not, I'm not making it up. Uh, let's see. The first parameter selects the files to be copied. has no effect on the new names to be assigned. Incidentally, there's knowing that start star will only select files in the directory. It will also, whoa, really? All right. Uh, the second parameter... The second character of the name will be changed to a B if it's question mark interesting. Interesting. So let's see. Uh, 
rename startup star to question mark question mark question mark six startup wow <clears throat> okay so i guess the problem here is that the last part all right so let me just try this so if i say rename star dot star to be shot zero one or shot one question mark question mark star dot star that works <laughs> whoa so i wasn't wrong we'll 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 say that the word wrong maybe doesn't exactly apply here or maybe it does that was interesting to say the least. So if I go to shot O2, Unix people are still laughing right now, let's be honest. Um, uh, so if I go to shot O2 and do the same thing, I'm good to go. Um, <laughs> oh, DOS. So precious. A little lemon sweets, so precious. Have you enjoyed renaming your little files? What would you like to do now? Rename shot three. Yeah. Well, you know, I uh, I didn't say it was going to be clean and efficient. I just said that it would work, and you know, it does work. Um, maybe for the folks at home, uh, you may be better if you, you know, if you were really going to do this, uh, in any kind of industrial way, maybe I would recommend go ahead and downloading one of those <laughs> renaming utilities. I know Ant Renamer was fine, uh, back in the day. There's probably other ones uh, now too. Uh, it's, it's not that hard, right? Uh, but this is probably not the best way to do it. I just, I am now so thoroughly amused at the craziness of it that, uh, I think, um, I will go ahead and, and finish it this way, but, y you know, don't, don't do this at home. This, this was, this is, this is just DOS being DOS. It's probably not the best idea in the world. Um, uh, you know, you do something better. Okay, uh, and so now, my understanding anyway, is I'll have to rename these manually, right? Because there is no actual way, supposedly, to do that. Like, it says it doesn't have insert, right? So, in theory, that just won't work, right? Yeah, so it can't, like... It can't add more characters, so those need to have, like, I need to go manually add the underscore uh, to those because there's, like, look, man, <laughs> what, what are you talking about? What, you think computers can just, like, insert characters in the middle of strings? What do you, what is, what do you think this is, right? It's not Mardi Gras, okay? It's not everyone's just partying and throwing soap around and, and stuff, right? This is not, this, this is, uh, this is... This is computing. You can't can't do any of that. Uh, all right, so that did what I needed it to do in in a in a DOS like you know kind of truncated way. You know, speaking of uh, of um, of Noam Chomsky, right? Kind of a, a what did I what did I use the phrase uh, for for Bacchus Nauer form and Comstock grammars? Um, weak and cumbersome. Is that what I said? I don't know, something like that. Uh, so anyway, I've got all these shots now, and, and really that's all that's in the intro pack, so I think I'm just going to move them in here, and we'll just leave it at that. Because again, I don't really care too much about this uh, part of it, because they're, I mean, that's all they are. They're just these shot plates. Uh, they don't really do anything else um, at all, and so I'll just go ahead and, and copy those in, and then we'll call it a day. So let me move those in here. Uh, and... Let me move these in here. And the thing that you can see about this is, you know, again, there's a certain amount of, uh, you have to kind of think about where, what you're getting into. 
heck is that? Oh, it's right, it's the snow blast. Um, you have to think about, you know, the point of diminishing returns at some point, right? On Handmade Hero, we'll often do things that have diminishing returns just because, I mean, it's an educational program uh, and it's also my weekend programming. So, you know, I'm not sitting around going, how do I get this thing done in the minimal amount of time, right? Uh, which is something that you might be doing if you aren't doing it as something for enjoyment or if you don't care or if you're, you know, if your job's on the line and so on. Uh, but just as a, as a, you know, aside, you can see how all of these things are named in a way that, that gives them structure. So when we, if we were going to go import them, we could add something to our parser that would actually understand how to make sense of the numbering scheme, right? And I don't know, we might want to do that. And I, that's the diminishing returns thing. It's like, do we bother doing something like that? Or do we just manually enter the text, right? Typing is hard. Uh, and I don't know, right? Every time you're faced with something like that, you have a call to make. Like, do you do it the long way or do you create something uh, that helps you do it quicker? And you have to make that judgment call. Now, in this case, I would say that maybe, you know, it's not really worth adding anything like that. And the reason would be because this is the only thing we have that looks like this, right? We don't, we don't actually have anything else that's got this structure to it. If we had tons of cutscene art uh, and we would have to, every time we'd have to do this, uh, that would maybe argue for doing it the other way, right? Uh, I'm just looking in here. It looks like I've got everything, right? Yeah. That might argue for doing it the other way. You know, that might argue for saying, look, you know, this, this is uh, gonna be something that we're gonna be doing a lot of. Uh, and so we should probably try to do something smarter here instead of, you know, uh, making a lot of work for ourselves where we have to keep putting these like plates in here or whatever. But I don't know that we really want to do that. You know, maybe it's fine for us to just say, look, we're going to use a, a bunch of this. Uh, it's just going to look like that. And we're just going to manually type them in. Uh, and if I remember correctly, and by remember correctly, I mean I don't remember. Uh, but if we go back and look at like our file for file formats, uh, we have in here this notion of a shot index and a layer index. Um, and the shot index layer index stuff actually does have uh, backing tags, right? So we can just do like, okay, shot index something and layer index something. And my recollection is that we have the ability to actually specify um, numbers with that with our old parser. Our new parser, I don't know if it could do numbers there. And so one of the things that I think we should do is support that as a feature. So if you want to actually have a tag that has a number, like that if you want to have a tag that rather than just being set to true or not, actually has a specific thing. So I can say like, this is shot index one, you know, layer index two or something. Uh, let's go ahead and just say, right? If I put parentheses in there, uh, I'm allowed to have a number that will then tell me, right? And so that way I can just kind of put all the plates in here that I want and I can just put the shot uh, layer numbers. And so you can see where I'm going with this. It seems easy enough that like, maybe let's not go add a system for doing something where we parse the actual name when we really don't have to because that seems good enough. So if I pop back over to DOS for a second, um, as we've seen it wield its mighty power today and everyone out there uh, at home, I'm sure, is just bristling uh, with, with the raw sort of fearsome power of DOS. Uh, if we could go ahead and just uh, um, sort of prevail upon it one more time to give us a, a show of, of, its, uh, of its prowess here. I'm gonna go into the intro cutscene directory just like we did for base game. And I'm gonna do a dir slash b. Uh, as you can see, that gets rid of all of the adornment. So if I look at the art directory and do it, 
uh, I can just get a list of everything here that I might want. Uh, and so what I can do in this case is a pretty short list, right? There's not that much there. Uh, so what I can actually do is just grab this. Uh, is it just, wasn't there supposed to be a shot 11? Did I screw something up? Did I, did I miss one? Am I, am I, am I, uh, look at that. I didn't copy those in. I tell you. Human error, operator error, people. Uh, so there's a shot 11 that was supposed to be there. Let's let's do that one more time so we can get that shot 11. There it is, right? Uh, so I might just be able to just cut and paste this from here without actually having to dump it to a file. Um, go. Uh, I don't know if that worked, uh, but we'll find out. It did. Uh, so now, uh, again, um, using sort of the old four coder here so we don't have a lot of power at our fingertips at the moment uh, we will get more as time goes on uh, but what i'm going to do now is just kind of grab all of these and move them over right uh, oops uh, and again this is sort of where the uh, and to be fair four coder also probably isn't quite there yet even with my new modified one which is very much much more powerful than emacs almost in every way uh, the only thing that it doesn't have yet is macro recording. Uh, Alan said that that is coming down the pipe, but that would be, you know, macro recording would solve this problem automatically, right? Uh, because this exact process that I'm doing and the process of extracting the shot number uh, and layer number would also be automated by macro recording. So it is too bad that we don't have macro recording yet um, because that's the sort of thing that would make this process easier. But like I said, there's not that much stuff in here, which is why, again, I'm just point of diminishing returns it. Uh, but that's just one of those things. That's often where you see, you know, again, like, Forkoder is kind of focused on the main stuff that we had to fix in, in Emacs, right? Um, and it pretty much did all that. But, uh, uh, and I'm pretty excited to show you, you guys the new one, too. The, the new one is, is pretty, pretty crazy, the stuff that I've got in there. There's some pretty amazing stuff that... Uh, I think is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, doesn't matter. Point being, um, it doesn't have some of those like more esoteric features uh, that something like Emacs or, you know, VI has from, you know, centuries of refinement uh, that are kind of like, you don't normally use them, but once in a while you do and they save you a lot of time at that point. Uh, you know, macro recording is kind of one of those things. Uh, because, or, or, you know, there's other, there's, you don't necessarily need specifically macro recording. There's other features that you could use like regexp, uh, modifications to lines and stuff like that, um, that you can do. But point being one of those sort of ways of taking, um, a piece of text and extracting parts of it in a sort of programmatic way, almost writing a little text processing sort of stuff. I find macro recording to be the easiest way to do that because you can just sort of demonstrate the change to the line and then you just play it back. I really like that. And because uh, Emacs's macro recording allowed you to record through things like search uh, and other sorts of things, you could really do a lot with it that you know made it seem like it was almost like a little programming language uh, without ever doing a programming language. So that was pretty cool. But admittedly, even that's a little bit um, weak, I suppose, in some sense. Uh, because you, you, it wasn't a programming language. So if you really wanted to in Emacs, probably Emacs power user sorts of people uh, would almost possibly prefer other uh, other ways of doing things too. You know, like the uh, writing a little elist macro or something to do the replacement and then running it. Because that could do anything, right? So it's a little hard to say, you know, I don't, uh, again, I don't want to uh, specify exactly what the best way to have done that edit would have been. But point being, if four code doesn't have that sort of stuff in it yet. Um, but we'll get there uh, at some point. It's just, it's not a high priority because this is not the sort of thing that I have to do very often. Um, so, you know, it hasn't been the kind of thing that's been tops on my list. But, you know, when you need it and you don't have it, you do notice. So it's always good to eventually get there and have it so you don't, you're not ending up having to do manual text processing like I'm doing right now uh, in those instances. It's just, you know, why? Even though it doesn't really matter, it's like, might as well just get, get a little thing in there that can do it and then be done. Uh, 
uh, because you can. So, all right, so I think we're good to go here. This is roughly what I'm talking about, right? Um, so now this has like everything listed uh, for the cutscene as well. And it's got the tags for the layer index and uh, the, <clears throat> uh, it's got tags for the layer index and the shot index in there that I just kind of uh, stuck in. And so now we can just use this for, for, uh, for everything. Both files are completely uh, specced out now. I don't know what we want to do with this thing. Um, uh, you know, well, you know what I could do? What if I just called that, you know, shot index zero, layer index one or something? It's like maybe shot index zero is a thing? Uh, probably not. You know, maybe I could just give it some other shot name. I don't know, like maybe this is shot 12. I don't know. Um, I could also just label it title screen, who knows. Uh, anyway, so point being, you know, got all this stuff in here. This would allow us to process those, those as plates. Um, and now all I really need to do is I just need to add to the parser something that allows us to do the same thing we were doing before where uh, if you stuck a number in to a tag, that sets the value of the tag to something other than one. Like normally what we do with tags because, you know, uh, they're Boolean a lot of the time is we just set it to one because that's sufficient. Uh, in this case, that wouldn't necessarily be sufficient. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and look at that HHT parser here, uh, which is this. Uh, what you can see is, wow, this thing is so simple. Uh, right, this is why I always think parser generators are silly, because it's like, yeah, this whole thing gets parsed by this, you know, tiny little piece of code. It's like, it would have taken me that long just to figure out why GAC was like breaking and Anyway, uh, so when I'm parsing the tag list, so you can see here, like I grab this identifier, right? And then we're gonna call into the tag uh, system to say, hey, let's get that. We then check uh, what token comes next. And what I wanna do here is I wanna look instead and say, let's expand this. Uh, I'm gonna look and see if the check type uh, equals token uh, parentheses, or uh, sorry, open parentheses. And if it is, I'm going to try and get a number out of it, right? Because that's sort of what we're saying. We're saying that if we parse an identifier for a tag, I want to be able to have a parenthetical with a number in it. And if I find that for some reason, uh, you know, it's something else, then I can process it just the way that I was going to process it before. Um, so really, I, I don't really want this uh, to look like that, right? I don't want it to be an else. I want to suck up the open print clause first if I need to. And then if I don't, oops, and this is wrong, should have been shot. If I don't, I can just fall through and continue the checking I was doing afterwards. But so this is just an additional check that can suck up a parenthetical phrase here as necessary, right? So if I see a parenthetical at the moment, because we only allow the parenthetical with the number, that's the only thing I've specified. Uh, all I really want to do is I want to say, okay, require a number, right? Uh, this will be the value of the tag. Uh, and then require a closed paren, right? Because you have to close it. We don't allow anything else. So it literally has to be this pattern always. There's no other, uh, you're, you're not allowed to do anything else. Uh, and this will be a uh, number con uh, constant part, um, some blah, blah, blah. So we don't have one of those. So we need token, what? Um, so I don't know that we want to distinguish between like floating point and non-floating point. So I'm just going to say like number because this sort of the suite of things we're parsing, it's not really the kind of thing where we have a strong opinion about that, right? Uh, so we really just wanna say, look, require token, um, any number will do. It can be a whole number or a fractional number. We just wanna get it uh, and then go from there. And so that seems good. And I think that's all we need. However, it does mean that we will need to put this in here. 
right? Uh, so we do need to be a little bit more squinky um, about what's going on here with, with, uh, with our parsing of numbers. So if we see in here that we've got a numeric type starting us off, and one of the other things that we have to be aware of uh, is you can see in here that we're not parsing any operators, right? So like we're not parsing things like minus uh, or any or plus, but if we were and we wanted to support negative numbers in here, we would need to be careful to make sure that our tokenizer properly looks and says, if I get a minus, if the next thing is a number, then treat this as a numerical value that has a, that's negative. Um, or we can do it the other way around, which says we just return the negative back to, like we add a token for negative, and we expect that the person who receives the number is doing something with uh, expression parsing where they will apply the negative themselves, right? So there's a lot of different ways that you can do this. For now, since we're only doing this for tags, I'm just, I'm strictly going to uh, do the most basic one, uh, which is to uh, sort of suck up the part of this that is numerical, including a decimal point, because like I said, uh, I would like to, to allow fractional values potentially. And that's the only thing we're gonna do. Now, if I remember correctly, um, we don't use ATOF anywhere. So actually what ends up happening is when we're doing our uh, parsing, we've got an S32 from Z internal. Uh, I don't think we've got an F32 uh, from Z internal, right? Uh, so you can see here, like we really only have the forward kind for most things. We haven't really parsed, it looks like, uh, most of these other ones here. So we do have one that will parse sort of regular regular old uh, integers. We don't have something that'll parse things with a decimal. Okay. Uh, so let's see what we can do about that. Uh, this is not gonna be good. This is low quality stuff here. Uh, but that's okay, because we don't really need it to do anything particularly fancy, right? So let's take a look at how this is working. If we see a numeric value, then what we want to do is we want to sort of get those numeric values uh, input into our number. So we want to start with whatever the number is, right? We want to say, all right, we'll accumulate into this number whatever we read, let's start parsing. So the first thing I can do is say, well, all right, let's keep going uh, as we do our advanced cares here, right? Um, so I can write this routine and say, while the thing that I see is a number, uh, continue parsing, you know, advanced cares. So if the thing is a number, um, then I'm going to get whichever number it actually is, like this, right? And just say, this is the digit that came in. And you can see that we're already doing that kind of over here, right? Oops. So that's the digit. And then as you can see, all we need to do is every time we read one of those digits, we just need to take and say, well, whatever we already had as our number, it obviously has one more decimal place to it because we just read a new one in. So multiply that by 10 to shift everything up and then we'll insert this new digit, right? Uh, so our number is just always equal to 10 times uh, whatever it was before plus the new digit that we got and that just adds things in. Then we go to the next character. When we're done parsing those, uh, really all we need to do is say, is there a decimal point here, right? So at this point we can then say, well, if whatever is that tokenizer at um, happens to be a decimal point, then we do want to process the fractional part, right? So we do want to process this same loop where we just read as many digits as we can. We wanna do the exact same thing. The problem is if you look at what we've got here, there really isn't any way to do what we were doing before because every time we go, we don't wanna operate at all on the number that we had, right? Because if you look at it, this number is already exactly what it should be as, as in terms of the part that's before the, de the um, well, that comes to the left, let's say, of the decimal point. So 
I've already got exactly what it should be. I don't want to modify it anymore, right? What I want to do is I want to add fractional parts to it. So really, I just want to add, right, the digit in, whatever it is. I don't want to change the existing number. I just want to add in the new fractional part. And the fractional part, well, it's, you know, it's going to, as I go further to the right, it's going to be higher and higher divisors of 10, right? Um, so the first thing that comes after the decimal point, it should be divided by 10. So, you know, if it was three, then it should be three divided by 10 is how much I would add, right? So what I really need here is a divisor. It would start off at 10. And every time I go down, it would gain another power of 10. So here I'm going to do, and you know, I can write this the other way so it's multiplicative. Um, you know, coefficient might be the better way to do it. So we're not necessarily doing the divide. Uh, again, it doesn't really matter for this, but. So the coefficient is 0.1. So I'm going to add 0.1 times the digit. And then I want to say, well, if I manage to go another round, let's make sure that we continue to fractionalize, right? Now again, what I want to underscore here is this is not a particularly good routine for converting decimal into binary, which is what you're doing. You're converting like a decimal floating point into a binary floating point number. There's better, more accurate ways of doing this, I'm sure. Uh, it's just, this is the simplest one to type in for our purposes, right? It's a very short, concise routine that will sort of work after I debug it anyway. Um, and so that's good enough for our purposes. But if you really care and you're making like the standard implementation of this or you're gonna do a permanent one for your library or whatever, you probably want to go more hardcore because decimal and binary are completely different ways of writing the number and converting using this introduces uh, a bunch of bit error potentially that you could recover. So if you're really trying to be accurate about it, right, this is not the smartest way to do it. Once you start to really care, right? Um, so it's worth noting there's a difference between those two. So once we get this numeric uh, token back, that's all well and good. What do we do now? Uh, well, we need to set the token type to what we just said. And we also need to set all the rest of this stuff to make some sense. The first thing we can do is exactly what we did before, which is said, look, let's just make sure that we record the actual text this right. But then we also have in our text field, I don't know if you remember, we set ourselves up for success uh, by actually providing here some values we can use to store what we found out so that people can use them directly. Uh, and so we know what the number is here. We also know here uh, that we wanna do a rounded version. So I'll go ahead and add that in here too, right? Uh, and that, I don't know if we have a round to int32, I guess we do, yeah. Uh, and so what I'd like to do now is just fill those out, get this token ready, and then now when we parse that as a number, uh, we can, you know, we can just go ahead and, uh, and and finish up. Now, is numeric, where is that? Oh, uh, it's is number. I don't, I guess we just called that the wrong thing. Uh, is number is what we actually meant. Uh, let me see though, we've got some other problem here. Uh, so round real, th real 32 to in 32, what are we getting complaints about on 192? Oh, I see. Uh, so this, is actually producing right an integer, but we want it to be a floating point for our purposes. So we can just go ahead and do that. Uh, the same would be true right here. Uh, and then I think we're good, right? Yeah. So that allows us to add values to our tags. And so now inside the parser here, when we parse, we now have all the information that we actually need uh, to do what we wanted to do. So our parser is ready to go um, and it's very, very tiny. And so you can see here, like there's really nothing to it. So what that says to me is I think I'm just gonna not bother putting this in a separate file. Um, I think I'm just gonna put this into the assets file and we're just kinda gonna go from there, right? Uh, and so I'm gonna dump this guy into here. There's another way we might wanna do this. Uh, like we may still want this to be part of a separate file, but what we would do is 
We might pull all of the edit style stuff out of here and put it into a separate file uh, because it's getting kind of long and it's worth potentially distinguishing that from the parts that are just used in running the game when no edits occur. Uh, right, there just, there might be something to that, right? Uh, so I'm going to go ahead here and uh, kill this. And I'm also going to go ahead and kill this. And then we're going to go ahead and deal with the fallout from that. So if I go into uh, this directory now and I do a build, um, it won't find those parse file. Uh, it won't find those uh, include files anymore uh, once I go ahead and delete them. So inside, oops, code. Uh, I'm going to delete handmade, uh, what, what is it called? It's like HHT, right? Yes. So I'm going to delete those two. Uh, and then when I build, you'll notice that uh, everything's fine except for the include of those things, which is what you might expect because, hey, uh, they are no longer existing. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get rid of those uh, completely. Those are all parser things. Uh, there we go. So this tokenizer now is relatively important. Uh, if I go look in here, I'm gonna pull some of these out uh, into forward declarations. And that way I don't have to care what order I do some of those things in. Uh, so I'm just gonna pull these out real quick. Here we go. Um, also, yes, this is not necessary anymore because it did in fact work just fine. Uh, grab that. And did we get rid of temp cast as well? I thought we finished that work. Yes, we did. So that's good too. Um, and we just need this, this, and this. So now you can kind of see, right, uh, we've got a nice little tokenizer here. Um, and the only thing we haven't really done is hooked up the actual error output to our error streams, which we actually do have. And so we're going to want to do that, uh, and we'll do that as we integrate it in. Okay. Um, somebody has a syntax error complaint, and, you know, that's fine for them. Uh, let's see where that was at. Um, I'm not sure what that's complaining about. Oh, it's just complaining about that. Okay, good. So then we're just left with uh, the fact that we had check HHT in here and I'm just gonna remove that uh, and we're gonna be done. All right. Uh, let's see what we wanna do now. I've got these HHT files and the main problem that I'm gonna have, I can just tell you right off the bat, is now that I can just go through these and process them, uh, I'm going to have a problem that we need our platform layer to be a little bit better about allowing us to find these things. Because what it, what's gonna happen inside the asset code is you're gonna see blockforest01.png. But if we jump over here, what we'll see is even if we know to look in the base game directory because this is base game.hht and we do that, you know, just assumption, it doesn't know where in here they will be. Now, there's two things we can do. One is we can just hard code the search, right? We can just say, look, you gotta automatically know to, to put art in front of it um, and then look in here and we expect everything to be there. The, the plus side of that is it's, it, it has some charm. It's very simple. It'd be hard to not understand it. You would know exactly what's going on. The only thing that's a little weird about it is that you then end up in a situation where these art directories might have a lot of stuff in them. There could be like a thousand files in here. And while you could, if you wanted to, 
you certainly could put subdirectories in there, but you would then have to put the subdirectory here, right? Make sense? Um, and again, that, maybe that's also fine with you because maybe, and I don't know, but maybe you want to be able to do the thing that we didn't do here, which is have a, instead of doing the rename like I did where now everything has a unique name, maybe you want to have everything be called layer zero, layer one, layer two, layer three, and you just have the subdirectory for the shot tell you which one it is, right? And then that would work because you'd just go like that and that's actually what you want. As I'm saying it, it sounds pretty good, I guess. Um, I mean, I guess I'll just say sure. Uh, maybe we do that and we just say if you want subdirectories you put them in here for now and I may want to change my mind about that um, so I'm not gonna stick to that particularly hard but since I don't have anything better to say that's what I'm gonna say for now um, so if you look here at import changed assets, uh, essentially what we would do, you, you can sort of see what's going on here. We call platform get all files of type begin uh, and we pass it the PNG. We no longer really have to do that. Uh, so now what we can do is just say that doesn't happen anymore. So we still want that call. It's good uh, because it's here for this right we want it for this where we import all of our um, our asset files there uh, and we probably want it for our tags stuff as well uh, but after that we can actually just change around uh, to to doing things by loading them directly by name right uh, and because once we get those tags in that's all we would really need I'm trying to think if there's anything else we would need to do there per se. Um, and I don't know. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so if I come back here and I look at the Win32 uh, handmade code, and I look at the platform file type uh, PNG stuff. So what you can see here is that it just, you know, it, it says, look, I'm gonna look in these directories when I'm looking for stuff and, and off we go. Uh, and so if in here I was to say, okay, there's gonna be a tag file, uh, right? And that's gonna be a thing. Or I guess I could say HHT file. Uh, then we know that that's in the tags folder and it would do that. And that would allow us to get all of our tags files, parse them, and know what we were looking at for an art packing list. My only question here is then, how exactly does the person load the files that come from uh, just arbitrary file names there? And that I'm not sure. So in other words, these two would kind of go away uh, because you wouldn't ever do that anymore. Um, you would just do this and the names would be implied or inferred, I should say, from the information that you gather here. So my question is, at that point, how do you actually load a direct file? Uh, and if we look inside the platform layer here where we've got, say, you know, load or a, a open file, uh, you can see that, you know, open file doesn't really take a path sort of a thing. Um, it's a thing that wants just a file info and it doesn't really have a path. It doesn't have an understanding about what a path is in that sense, right? So we would need to have an open file name, a thing that does an open file 
that is based on some some kind of uh, composite of those path names there. Uh, and I mean, I think that's just unavoidable if we want it to go from text file forward to, you know, to something. And so that, you know, I think that's just how that has to work. So in other words, we would read this string, we would know uh, the actual string that we have for, like, like where we expect this to be in the sources directory, right? Um, and I think we would just go from there. So let's see to what extent that actually works. Um, we've got this platform open file thing, right? And uh, if I want to do a pound define of this in a different way, uh, like so, uh, I'm going to go ahead and say, let's see, platform open file, uh, let's see, by name, uh, instead of a, a file info. And, and I guess file info, I could still do this. So what I might do, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I'm trying to decide what I would want to do here. Uh, because I have this notion of the file info, I kind of want to leave maybe this open file working the way it is. And so really uh, what I kind of want is get file um, by name. And instead here, this would return a platform file info, right? Uh, and it would take maybe a pointer to the result. I'm sorry, uh, a pointer to the name. And the mode flags are for opening, so it wouldn't be anything there. So, you know, it would be something more like this, <clears throat> where you can get the file info uh, and then release the file info. And the reason they don't 100% love that is because it means that you have to, like, acquire and release these. You know what I mean? Uh, and that's maybe less good. Like I would rather it have just been something you can return and forget about. So you may ask me, and this is a very good thing to ask me, <clears throat> why not just make it something you can release? And the answer is because if you remember, we need to handle Windows's ridiculous, uh, we didn't use UTF-8 because we didn't think of it and we used UTF-16 instead, and then the <coughs> Unix people came along and said, hey, wait a minute, what if we made this UTF-8 thing, everything would still work? And then Windows was like, oh, whoops, we just rewrote all our code to be bad. Um, so we need to handle the fact that there's a platform-specific file name that actually bears no relationship to the actual file name that we're talking about, uh, and it's based on UTF-16. And so that's some arbitrary-sized thing that we're doing in here. And so, you know, I think we need to keep that semantics as much as I don't love it, right? Um, that's kind of just what it would have to look like. And so this, uh, or I, I should say by path maybe, And so this way you could say, look, here's the path that I think uh, this file should be inside our sources. Uh, and it will just come back uh, with, you know, the, the file info for it. And the re like I said, the reason I don't like that is that you have to close that somehow. And so here, you know, you call this begin um, and end. And you got the file group here. I don't know, maybe that's a good enough way, you know, we could maybe make it so that you do it inside these. Um, and so you don't really have to worry about freeing it because that will clean it all up for you. 
Uh, that's one way to think about it. Let me look inside Win32 to see how that was happening at the moment. Um, Cause I don't really know. So did that just, so that literally just returns a linked list, I guess. Um, right, Ed, that you just iterate over. Um, so maybe let's do it that way. So what we would say is you pass the file group in, you just say, here's the like thing that I wanted to talk about. Um, it'll be part of this and then that'll just clean it up. I'm okay with that. Um, I don't have a problem with that. So all we would really need to do then at that point, it's really not that bad. I guess this is, this is pretty nice because it's a pretty simple way of just extending what we already had to work with arbitrary path stuff if you want. All we really need to do is, is come in here and say, well, where, where's the open file, right? Here's how that was working and, and get the get all file types and all that stuff. Um, so in here, I just need a thing that's like, hey, uh, yeah, we need one of these. Uh, for win32 get file by path uh, and it needs to take those two parameters and produce an actual like something that works uh, out of that right okay so how are we doing this before you can see it here uh, you can see us producing sort of the win32 find handle version of this stuff Right, here's the find data, here it produces the whole thing. Uh, and it looks like we could maybe just, I wish I had more to drink here. It looks like we can maybe just use this code, right? All we would have to do is uh, call this bottom part of the routine a separate routine and the wildcard function uh, is just a full file name and that's it right um so i think we just have a thing here that's like hey uh this is called win32 get file info from wildcard because sure uh and this thing Uh, is just going to be the interior of this routine. Uh, and then we're going to call that. Right? Because that's exactly what this routine does. It says, give me a path. I will produce all of the information that you requested uh, for the things in that path. And then I will be done. Right? Uh, and we've got this platform file group result here that, you know, it generates. And so really all we have to do is this file count here, um, well, even that just works because that just tells you how many got produced. So it'll just add to the, so you could look at the total number if you cared, which I don't know that you would. I, I think that just works. So here, once we create all of these, uh, looks like they get pushed on to, you can see here like, first file info equals info and the next pointer i assume yeah just just so it just does a chain right off of here and so all we really need to do is pull off whatever one is on that next pointer so yeah again really really straightforward uh just not a lot to it so I think that means all we would have to do here, let me think for a second, is we have to set the next pointer to point in and we have to get the first pointer out, but that's it. So I think all we need to do here is just say, look, we've got a platform file info that's like, you know, uh, the end, like this is the one that at the end of the chain you produce, uh, Put, put that on there, right? Or uh, set next to this, right? 
And so in here, we're just going to say that. Like, this is what you're going to set the next thing to, right? Um, I think that's basically what we need to do. Uh, so let me think about this. This is a recurrence thing. So we're basically saying, look, there's a pointer here uh, that's the head of the list. Um, each time through here, we put the head into the next pointer, right? Um, and then down here, we set the head equal to it, right? And so if we want to seed that value, we just do this, and then we're done. Uh, and then we return the head as our result, right? I think that's it. So the file count is fine, uh, and we want the Win32 file group here, so we want the Win32 platform file group, right, uh, to be passed in. Although that is not the only thing because we also have whatever the weird, yeah, this thing, right? So the result platform thing. So really I could say we, we just pass this in if I wanted to, right? So we have the file group here and this can come out of this. I think that's all we need. This is that. This is that as it should be. All of that just works. Nothing weird happening there. This is all good. Um, and off we go. So then in here, when we actually want to use this thing, right, uh, this needs to return the head of the chain, uh, which it will do right here. Uh, I'm going to call that result now that we've gotten rid of result as a thing. Right? Pretty easy. And now we could call it from both places. So this guy who was doing it before can just say, off you go. Uh, we're going to set the, the file group. So that's our result. Um, that's got the pointer to the first one of these, uh, which I've now forgotten the name of. First file info. So the first file info is going to be whatever comes back from this thing. Uh, we're going to pass the file group to it, which I believe is just the result in this case. Uh, and the set next to, is that right about that? Yeah. The set next to is just going to be whatever was in there to begin with. Now, that actually happens to be zero in this case. So really, now that I think about it, I guess we never really need to pass that in um, because we just don't actually use it. So really all we need is like the information that this thing was using now. So yeah, this, this can just be zero, right? Uh, and that result chain can just do its thing. So the file group gets passed in. This has to be the wildcard, right? We need that wildcard data. Uh, and the wildcard is a WKRT uh, pointer, right? If I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, and I don't know what else it needs. So hold on a second and let me compile just so I can see uh, what it doesn't have. Um, so it's upset about this because I didn't cast it properly. And that's a pretty reasonable complaint. Uh, wildcard is undeclared. Oops, yeah, that's a spelling problem. Let's try that one more time. So yes, yeah, stem size was being used here to basically take the wildcard and append the correct thing onto the end of it when we actually got the name back. Um, so we do want to potentially pass the stem size in so that it can do that optimization. The only thing I'm not sure about here is how do we actually want um, the other one to work? So if you pass the stem size here, uh, then that should allow us to do that. 
that one just fine. Uh, but, and where's the, what's the stem is the location, right? So it's stem and stem size, both get passed here. And that's a w, WKRT as well. So I don't know how the other one will work with that. I have to go look at how those names are constructed, but I suspect we can probably just pass no stem uh, or, or have some way of saying don't bother reconstructing the name because we don't need to build it in any other way, right? The, the actual thing we hand you is the complete name anyway, right? So I'm not sure what we want to do about that exactly. Uh, well, you know what? It probably just works if we just do the part after the slash anyway. So maybe we can have it still build the name. I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, we'll have to take a look. Uh, anyway, so here I think we're pretty good to go in most cases. Uh, we've got a problem. Can I grab one for five? Okay. So here where we're actually um, passing this, uh, this wants a platform file group star and instead I, I had it taking a um, uh, the actually the whole thing which is not what I wanted so we want file group dot to be file group arrow here um, but other than that we're good <clears throat> so I think that's all we really need uh, to get the old one working so now what we need to do is just make the new one work uh, for this where we've got PNG and WAV and stuff and now I think what we're gonna say is look let's get rid of that and we'll just have HHT be the only other thing that's in there. Let me see if we use those anywhere else. I don't know if we do, uh, just so I can find it. Yeah, so it's only in the import asset changes, which is the part we're removing. So I think I'm okay with just having that uh, be out of here. Now, if I look back at this code what I'm going to want to do is call it here to produce a platform file info structure that I can return. So this is what I'm aiming for. <clears throat> this, I believe, we can just get because we know that that gets passed to us directly. So it gets passed in here. Also, I don't know, missing it. The semicolon's not supposed to be in there. So the file group is just something we have. So that's easy. The path is in the wrong format. So it's getting passed in as UTF-8. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, but we don't want it to be UTF-8, right? We need it to be uh, the, we need to be CARE-T, right? It needs to be um, WCARE-T, UTF-16. Uh, and so what I need to do is I need to do uh, this same conversion, right? Uh, or, well, actually, it's, it's sort of what we're doing here, right? I need to, to do this preparation of the wildcard text uh, to produce the entire string for this thing. And again, when we look at what's happening in here, um, you know, it seems like maybe, maybe I want to break this up even a little bit more granular maybe i shouldn't quite have done that it's hard to say because it like actually this part i would have to duplicate outside anyway to even be able to pass uh the wildcard handle in so you know maybe we just want because this code we want to share but that's pretty easy to share right like the file date and file size are pretty trivial for us to to share um and so the part where we actually use the name, I don't know, like maybe it's just doesn't matter. Um, maybe what we really want to pull out is just this. So let's at least do that part, and then we'll think about it. So 
So in here, I know that I need to do this, right? And so uh, I'm gonna grab this part here and say, that this code I'm gonna see if, uh, what I can do there. Looking at the base name stuff, just where that gets used, you can see that we don't use it anywhere below here. So I believe I should be able to grab this part here and say that could in theory just be done as one chunk, like so. Um, and then when I call this, what I could say is, all right, the part that we're actually trying to convert here, right, um, is base name begin base name size uh, and it's going into info base name base name storage right so what I should be able to do here is say okay uh, we've got a result um, the result is going to be this and so down here we're going to plug it in like that. So that is the code we would need for doing the UTF-8 conversion. Now base name begin and base name size. Um, base name end and base name begin are what are used to generate that size. We could say that maybe that part should be done outside because it depends on who's doing it, whether you'd want to do it that way or not. So we just pass in base name size, uh, and then we also pass in uh, the, like the source, right? Um, yeah. So this converts one way. So this will convert, uh, I'm sorry, this is the wrong way around. That's this way, right? So this will convert UTF-16 to UTF-8 if we want to go that direction. Uh, and then we need a thing that converts the opposite direction as well, right? So we need a thing that will convert from UTF-8 to UTF-16, which is the exact opposite function, if that makes sense. So I think that's all fine, right? There's base name size, there's base name begin. And then if I wanna go the other direction, I should literally be able to use the exact same function. So here I've got UTF-8 to UTF-16. I would pass uh, the, and you know, this, this could, oops. Did that actually, oh wow, weird. That actually did exactly what I wanted though. So I guess I did want that to do it everywhere. Um, so in here, right, I'm just saying, look, convert this uh, from 16 to, to eight. I can do the opposite. That's almost the exact same thing. I say, here's the name that's in UTF-8. Uh, I then need to com compute how much I'm gonna need. I only need two, because if I'm going to UTF-16, I know that any individual UTF-8 character can at most expand to two UTF-16 characters, um, but really it could probably only expand to one, but that's a separate issue. So obviously I don't need more than that. Um, I can create this result here uh, as a W care T, right? Um, I can do the push size uh, exactly the same way that I was doing it before. Here's my name storage. Um, and I can null terminate it if I want to, uh, although I don't know that I necessarily do, uh, but I certainly can. And so when I do the push size here, I would just need an extra two for the null terminator, right? And that's what would happen here. Uh, let me also do base name to just name. There we go. Uh, and so here we just do multi byte to white, multi byte to wide care. And I believe we can just swap the two of these. Also this here info name is supposed to just be result, right? I think we could also say that name storage uh, should be results storage, right? Um, and this is result size. Does that make sense? That seems possibly more like what we want. 
Uh, so in here we then have the same thing and I'm gonna put name storage to result storage here as well. <clears throat> uh, and this is result size. So if we do multi-byte to wide care, what we need to do here is pass in um, the name begin name size. I don't remember the actual format for this, so I'm gonna grab it from MSDN. Let's see here. So we need the code page, and the code page should be the same, right? We need the flags, and the flags should also be the same, which is that I don't think we care about any of that. Um, so for the most part, that's a, uh, identical. We need the multi-byte string and its length. So uh, yep, and yep. So the multi-byte string and the wide string go in the, am I reading that right? The multi-byte string in this case is the result, so the result comes first. No, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, that's right. Uh, so the multi-byte string comes second and that's the result. So that's right, which is what we want. Uh, and there's no additional trailing stuff here, right? But this is the result in the result storage, which is what we expect. And that all looks fine, right? Uh, so now we can convert in either direction, which is what we wanted. Um, and all I really need to know now is where you want the memory to go. And so that can actually be something that you just pass in. And I don't really care where you get it from. And so people here, you know, they'll just say, well, it goes with the file group. But if you were going to do something else with it, then you do something else with it, and it's not going to affect anybody. So that seems good. Yeah. All right, so here where we've got name begin and name size, it's really just name in both cases. Uh, and I think most of that all looks fine as well. Let me just see what other my, what my other errors are here. Um, don't ask me why I did what I did right there. I didn't mean to do that. Uh, and here are res results storage plus two plus size. This is has to do one of these. Oops. Uh, because it's a WKRT that's coming out of that. All right, and let's see. Okay, so don't care about that. I do care about this. Uh, this one wants to be UTF-16 to UTF-8, right? Um, and you know what, I should use a better naming scheme for this. I should do UTF-8 from UTF-16. I like from phrasing better. Um, it's because you say which thing you actually want on the left-hand side and then the right-hand side, so it like lines up better with the way the text actually goes. So here it's like, I want a UTF-8, I'm giving you UTF-16, uh, right? Uh, and off I go. Yeah. Um, so that seems good. Uh, I don't have any real complaints there. And the stem size stuff, like I said, now, now that that's sort of handled that way, I think pulling this out was not really that necessary, right? So I think I just erred there in thinking, because really all I needed was these two functions. I didn't really need this thing to be made generic for really any particular purpose. I could pull this one piece of it out um, <clears throat> where you create one of these things uh, and it does the conversion of this stuff for you. Maybe we'll do that, but all the rest of this isn't actually shared. Uh, and so I don't know, I, I don't know if that's really what we want to do there. So hard to say, right? 
Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to grab this and I'm going to reinsert it. So uh, I'll say, look, that was a mistake. Forget about it. F pretend I never said that. Erase this video so people can't tell uh, that I that I did it. Right? Just erase all traces of it. Just you know, it's just it's gone. Uh, and so what I want to do here is say, uh, oops, uh, result first file info there. And up here, I want to say uh, result first file info. And here, I want to say result file count. Uh, and then just let that do what it was doing uh, before, right? Uh, and that seems good. Uh, so now, if I take a look at this, uh, yeah, where's, what's the stem size nonsense? What are you complaining about? Uh, so what I want to do now, and there's a result, something here, win32, get found from rock card, this is gone. Uh, so the only thing that I might want to do now is this part that puts a platform file info on, on the sort of stack, stacks them up here. That's the only thing that we might really want to uh, have at there. Now, first file info, if you look at it, I don't know why this is being done so far away. I feel like it would be fine to link it in early or put another way, link it in late. So meaning the info structure here, as you can see, it doesn't really get, it's just base name uh, that ever actually, uh, base name and platform that get mucked with there. So another way to look at it would be maybe this linkage can happen down here, <clears throat> right? Uh, and so at that point, all I wanted to say was, you know, okay, so if we're, or I, and you know what I mean, unless this isn't multi-threaded, so really, again, even this is fine too, right? Either way, I think is fine. So if I do that, then I think what I could do is say this part of the code, which I do want to be sort of similar, maybe I can make a way of making that shared, even though it's going to be a little bit tricky for some reasons I'll show in a second. Um, so what I want to do is share this because effectively what's going to happen in this code down here, right, is I want to do win32 get file by path and I need to build up this path that I'm going to, you know, I've got this path, I got to convert it uh, and then I have to uh, grab the file attributes of that thing. So if I want to, I don't actually have to get a handle to the file to get the file attributes. I can get them directly uh, by just calling get file attributes. Uh, ex on the file so you can see here that I just need to pass a file name uh, and then a file uh, attribute data structure will magically come back for me which actually has all the stuff that I need right I need that and I need that and they're all there so if I want to I can have a win32 file attribute data structure and it doesn't have any strings in it, so it shouldn't really be a W or not. It should just be Win32 file attribute data. Uh, and I can do a file data here. Then what I can do is say, why don't you, and I, maybe I'll clear it because you know I'm saucy like that. Uh, then I'll say, look, why don't you give me that information? Get, oops, file attributes uh, ex. Looks like that's already in here. Yeah, so we're already using that to get the, the right time there, right? So you can actually see us calling it right here. Um, so we want to basically make that call. Uh, this is using a care star file name. So this is actually an A style call, um, meaning that's actually doing this, right? Uh, why we didn't do that, I don't know. Those are both that. Um, but in this case, since we're supporting the wide care stuff uh, in terms of being able to, you know, people want to name their files with, you know, kanji in them or something, right? So if we want to do that, here where we call get file attributes ex, what we want to do is say, look, give us back this, this, you know, find data, right? And I guess like that's one reason we wouldn't have to clear it. We could just say, look, if this fails, it fails. What we want to do here is pass a file name that's wide. So this is the, this is the like uh, path 16, right? 
path that's in UTX-16. Uh, and then we can get the data out of it here and figure out what we're going to do with it at that point. OK. So we know we have a platform file info result, like so. Um, I know I've got to return that. And so the question is, how do I make one of those here? Uh, and furthermore, the question is, where do I get this from? Now, <clears throat> one thing that's a little bit tricky in this case, uh, right? because I know I can do this. If I just pass the path here, the problem is that path is going to be relative to a base directory. And those base directories are sort of hard-coded things that we just made as rules, right? And we probably want to keep doing that. So meaning this data here, like we probably want that hard-coded. However, we might not want it hard-coded here. Maybe that lives a little further up. So possibly, really, this actually is exactly that. Um, so if we add this in here and we say uh, that the Win32 file group memory, like so, is used to convert this thing to a pass 16, we then ask for that pass 16 and we you know, hopefully get it, right? If we get it, all we need to do now is create one of these platform file infos. And we know exactly how to do it, it's this. But the question is, do we want this to be a little bit more systemic, right? Uh, because you can see this stuff here would be sort of duplicated. The problem that we have is that this, right, is not exactly the same structure as this. Now you can see that they're basically exactly the same. And you would have hoped that Windows would have just used them the same structure for the same thing, right? Because they're exactly the same except for this, really. And you could have just left that field blank, right? Better yet, you could have kept it this way if you wanted to, but included this in this so that this struct is just in here. So instead of these, you actually just have that. Now, we could be super squinky, right? We could be squinky squared and say, because I happen to know this is a D word, file time, file time, file time, D word, D word, that happen to be exactly the same ones, I'll just pretend it's one of these, even though it's not. Now that's super squinky, but you know what? I might do that. Why can I do that? Because Windows isn't really allowed to change. We link to it, and it has to provide us those types back, right? So it's like, well, if I wanted to support a future compile that changed the definition of these in the header and linked to some new set of Windows libraries, this would be a really bad idea, right? But if I never do that, I don't know. Oops. So we could just do that if we were super squinky um, and just want to give a you know big old middle finger to Windows, um, which you know I do want to do most days. Uh, and in fact, I can also do this here. Uh, I can just take all of this stuff, this whole bit here, and say that all of that's going to happen. <clears throat> in one little chunk there, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, and I can take the file group for that somewhere in here. Uh, whoops, that's not the code I wanted. Uh, so I can just take that and yeah, I can just go from there. I think that just works. Uh, so we get the memory here, and we link it in here. And everything else just needs that find data. So what we can do here is say, look, uh, this is going to be the file attribute data. Uh, 
We're going to use the pointers off of this. And we're just going to be super naughty. Like, that's just what we're going to do. And so here, we'll say allocate, or sorry, win32 allocate file info. Uh, we will pass the file, oops, pass the file group. And we will pass the find data. And we will just straight up pretend uh, that it is a win32 file attribute data pointer, even though it is not. Uh, so let's see. There is a place mistake that I made there. Otherwise, we're fine. There we go. Um, is that really true? File group is an undeclared identifier. That is true. It is result. Um, function doesn't take two parameters. That's true. We need to get the string length of this because uh, we take us. It takes a size actually. Uh, and then I think we're good to go. That allocates the file info. Um, so that's actually it as I took a rather screwed route because I didn't I was kind of thinking we would need more from the iteration routine than we actually did but we didn't we only really need this part um, and that should allow us to get files either way uh, which is good it's what we want um, what did I do wrong there I, that's supposed to be that Um, so I think that's good. And now what we want to do is when we're doing our parsing, we're just going to call this uh, function and we're going to have to basically pass in, you know, the path that we want to use to find it. Uh, and then it'll take care of the rest. So what we can do there is in here, when we do import changed assets, what we're actually gonna do now is we're gonna sort of change that to be uh, the parse HHT. Um, so I'm gonna take import changed assets, I'm gonna drop it down below that, uh, and I'm gonna sort of nerf the code a little bit at the moment, right? Like so. This should recompile us fine, I think. And let's make sure that we didn't introduce too many bugs in the uh, iteration code, because let's see if we can still find our, our uh, HHA files here when we actually run Win32 Handmade. So if I run Win32 Handmade here uh, and we go, it's like, can we find the H? Yeah, we can, so we're good, right? Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that iteration still worked, okay. So now you can kind of see why I like this idea better because it sort of starts to solve some problems for us. In the old days, we had no idea where stuff went. We just had to make this concept of a default local HHA file. And that default local HHA file was like where stuff was supposed to go. But now what we can do is say, actually, we know exactly what HHAs go with which imported uh, things because the tags file tells us. So this thing right here has a name, it's called basegame.txt. So we know that there should be a basegame.hha that all of the things from this get packed into, right? Uh, and that helps us understand the relationship between these two things. Now, if we want to, we can even take it one step further. We could actually do this. Um, we could say that we're going to specify exactly where it goes. And that way we can have multiple files that target different HHAs or the same HHA and stuff like that. So maybe that's a good idea too. 
Um, and then if I go over there to our HH uh, um, T parser, we've got this. We can say like, hey, yeah, there's this other field here that's just like the HHA, right? And it tells us where that goes. You know what I mean? Um, so that's another nice feature we could add where we just say what the target is. And that way, if we want everything to pack into a single HHA, we just can. Uh, or we can not do that and later specify it. Or we can also have one text file that has everything in it, even though it generates multiple HHAs by changing this periodically. So that seems good. Like all that seems good to me. Uh, and I think that's what we want. So now what I can do is say, all right, inside here where we're doing this loop and we parse everything, uh, I can just say, yeah, let's let's set like a token for each of these things. Uh, like so, you know, this sort of thing. I want to be able to do something like this. Uh, and then when I do the parse tags list, right, uh, I would also be able to do something where I, well, I'm, I, to be honest, I'm not really sure exactly what we want to do with that parse tags list, but something, right? Um, so what I want to do here is say, okay, what about like having this sort of thing be something I can keep around? So it's easy for me to say when I'm parsing the default one, uh, store any of the results I get back as being things that will permanently be used to set future things when they want to know what the author is of something, right? Uh, that should be pretty straightforward to do. We just need something here that's like struct like uh, HHT fields, right? And this just has what those fields are in it, like so. Uh, we know that the author is just going to be one string. So we know that there's just like one of each of these, right? Because those are basic. Um, but what we don't know is how we would store the tags. And maybe tags are not something that you can apply on Moss like that. I don't know. Um, again, kind of hard to say. So I'm going to keep it simple for myself at the moment and not try to answer that question. Um, but what I want to do here, right, is say uh, what we're targeting. So let's suppose I have a default fields, and I just start it by not having anything in the default fields. Then when we come through here and I get a token to figure out, like, what we're actually going to do, like, so in here, right? Um, and in fact, I guess this needs to be up a little further, right? So when we parse a top-level block like this, uh, what I need to do is probably say, all right, here's the default fields. And uh, furthermore, I'm going to have like my fields, right? <clears throat> Something like this. Uh, and so what I can do is say, start off with nothing for our fields. If this is going to be the default, right? Uh, then what I want to do is I want to parse the fields and set them. And so I want to re-vector this. So maybe what I could do is something maybe more like this. Uh, so what I want to do now is say, okay, anything I parse should, should set the default fields, right? Otherwise, if I find one of these, then what I want to do is assign the default fields to my fields. So I want to do the opposite, right? Like that. Then when I come through here and I'm parsing these things, I can just say, all right, now I'll override each of the fields that I get. Um, I'm going to override them with whatever I find here, right? Um, so now, again, with almost no change the code, I just keep running defaults and it just works, right? Uh, so each of these, when I get the string back, um, I'm gonna sort of take here the text from it, like so. Uh, and that should do it. Now, inside here where I've got this tags, <coughs> excuse me, 
That is not part of the fields at the moment because we don't really know exactly how those are getting parsed. So we're gonna leave that out for a moment. Uh, everything else currently now actually works. So when we parse one of these top level blocks, we actually do know what we're doing with them. Um, but now like we're gonna have to actually, well, for lack of a better term, we're gonna actually have to do something uh, with them and actually make it happen, right? Uh, so if we see tags here, we're still gonna do this parse tag list part probably, but if it's the default, if we're doing the default, we throw them away basically, probably. Probably that's what we do, I don't know. Again, we have to think about how we wanna work with that later. But everything else will just work. So now let's think about what we wanna do uh, as far as, um, as far as actually producing output from this. Uh, I don't know how much time left, right? I got what, like 15 minutes or something. Um, so if I come through here and look at sort of what some of the other things are that we're doing, you can see that I've got a bunch of like tag array stuff when we do parse pieces here, uh, this is all the stuff that we were doing before to import things. So we would produce like an import type, like multi-tile or whatever. And we would have one of these sort of tag arrays and stuff like this. And what you can see when we're looking at this is since those tag arrays are actually all the exact same, we should be able to just create them once and then point at them. Right, um, that should be pretty straightforward for us to do. And so again, it's really just gonna be what we wanna do with the tags uh, eventually there. We can also, if we want to keep doing it exactly the way we're doing it and just have something that re-vectors based on a type here, like instead of doing the strings are equal to part, um, it just does a, a, a jump. Like, I don't know, right? Hard to say. Um, So I think what I, I think what I'm probably gonna say, honestly, is maybe we'll just do the principle of like least code change, for lack of a better term, and we'll literally just call this as directly as we can. Maybe, because we can do this really pretty directly if we want to, right? And bear with me for a second while I explain what I mean. So if we just called parse pieces, and instead of passing it a file name, we just actually pass it the tag array and or pass it, break it into two pieces and do the tag array part separately ourselves, right? We can pretty much leverage like most of the rest of this I think. I mean, I think we just sort of can. So instead of this code right here, like you can see the way this is working, instead of this part right here where we do like block type index and this sort of nonsense, um, instead of that, what we could do instead is to just actually use this exact code, the code that we're looking at right here, to actually do that that cracking. I'm not 100% sure about whether I like that or not. And the only difference is, do you see how these always have like end tags happening? We just get rid of the call to end tags. Like that's it, right? Um, so again, I don't know how I really feel about that um, in the grand scheme of things. Like, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if I'm doing something stupid there, but it seems like it just works. So I think I'll just do it. So if we look at what happens here where we do this, um, what I'd rather do is just say, uh, like, you know, parse pieces. We're gonna call this. 
we're not going to use this. I'm going to make sure that all of the things that in, are in there actually for what we've got. Body, character, right? Uh, cover, hand. Uh, is head in there? Yeah, head was in there. Uh, item, obstacles, and plate, right? So they're all in there and it would work, right? So instead of using block type, we just skip that. We don't do that. We call parse pieces. Parse pieces will return to us an import type. Like so, right? And at the moment, uh, we don't have import types for like cover uh, or, or like item or plate or stuff, but we do actually know what these are. We just didn't create anything for them. So I'm just gonna stub them temporarily and put it to do in here. Uh, and we know that like these do work like this. They're multi-tile, right? We know that this one is a single tile, but it's actually, isn't there like a, is there any, I, I don't remember if there's like some other type of thing that's like a single tile. I guess we don't have uh, to say if it's, no, we do. I was gonna say, I'm trying to think of that. So plates, I think, aren't limited in how big they are or something, right? So the, I think there's a difference in plates. They, they don't have to conform to like the 512 by 512 thing or whatever. So a plate is its own like kind of import uh, that we do. So if we do this, we'll get that back. And uh, here we have like the unrecognized type of import artwork problem. That's fine. Uh, like I said, we're going to sort of uh, look at that in a little bit more detail in the future how we want it to do those errors. Um, but what we really can do, actually, you know what we can do right here to say, look, if the result comes back as import type none, uh, then we can do the error on the outside. So here in the asset list, uh, where we do the parse HHT top level block, when this thing comes back, we can just say if the import type is none, uh, we've got an error. Now, we might want to do it a little bit more like that and do the error down here. Um, block token is what that's called. And that way we know like, hey, uh, we hit something that someone said we were supposed to import. We don't know what it is. Like it's not a block, it's not an item, it's not a whatever, right? So like, we're just, forget it. We don't know what's going on. But assuming we do know what's going on, then this happens, right? Makes sense. Uh, and furthermore, I might go ahead and, and leverage this part up here. Uh, we could sort of stop talking about found necessarily. Um, I'm not sure how we want to look at that, but we could maybe make this be more of like, is it a default block or not? Because we're going to do something differently depending on which one it is, right? So we'll look at that a, a little bit later. So assuming that we found one of these things, when we call parse pieces, uh, we need to pass it some stuff. We need to pass it this, right? Uh, and we probably want to rejigger a few of the things that are in here, right? But mostly it's okay. Mostly this is all fine. File name is the thing that really we need to change the most because, again, this tag stuff now, we really don't want it talking about that because we're handling that lower down. <clears throat> so we want to stop passing this name at all, all we really want is just the block type text, right? That's the only thing that we want it to be uh, doing. And furthermore, we could make that be an explicit token. So we could say here that this is uh, the, you know, uh, type token. And here in, we could just say like uh, token equals. And that's how it will check. Now there's a reason why I want to do type token here. The reason I want to do type token is because if I'm going to uh, output an error, I would like to output an error with the actual uh, 
Ideally, I'd like to output the error with a marker that says, here's it in the text stream where it came from, right? Because that will help with debugging later on. So I would want to do this. And if someone was going to output an error for some reason, I would want it to go there. I don't know that we're going to need to output any errors here. Hopefully the answer is no. But if, if the answer ends up being yes, that's OK. All right. So what I don't want is to, you know, this tag builder thing. What I don't want is the end tags to ever occur. Uh, because if the end tags ever occurs, uh, then I'm going to end up in a situation where I uh, I can't put the other tags on that I wanted to from my tag list, right? So that's the real, the part that we're really going to have to work at here to, to port uh, as we're sort of massaging this code, right? So I'm going to go through here, oops, uh, and just replace these real quick. Uh, like so, but otherwise they're pretty much the same. Um, yep. Uh, there we go. Okay, so that allows us to do all the checking we were doing before. And then really the problem, like I said, is now we just have to see how we want to do those, uh, keep those tags, uh, tag applications working properly. So I think what I want to do is I want to have the tag builder probably, the begin call is probably going to come outside. So, uh, you know, I'd call that tag build out here, you know, it'd, it'd be something like this. Uh, and then when I, you know, come in here and we're trying to pass this stuff in, uh, I would want to pass the tag builder in so that the thing when it does parse pieces, it can just make uh, all that tag stuff work. Now, if you take a look at what's happening here, uh, with like tag basic category and that stuff. What I need to be able to do there is this stuff, what we were doing tag ID from name and all that, right? This is the whole part that needs to sort of happen inside the tag parsing code itself. So the part where we do like the parse tag string stuff, like this, this part, right? Parse tag list, this. Um, this is needing to happen here. Right? So we want that to be something that's happening there. It doesn't need the for I loop, right? Doesn't need any of that. Um, it's just the interior part that we're actually going to use. Uh, and more specifically, I guess it actually, it happens uh, here. Right, so that part we're gonna keep. And what we need to do is solve this basic category thing. That's the part that, uh, you know, these things here, when they call end tags, they say uh, what the that uh, asset tag was. We can throw that over to begin, to the uh, begin tags part of things by just adding the, um, uh, the category part in here. But you can see when it does this result type ID part, that's the part that is a little bit harder. Because this, when we return it, it needs to know what that category actually was. And so it almost seems like that's something we're gonna have to provide uh, in addition or that gets stored on the builder. Now, because we can, I think I might want it to be stored on the builder so basically what ends up happening is in here, instead of passing a category into end tags, it's assumed that somewhere you set that. So it's assumed that somewhere you said like,
this. Um, and I would say, that right and so now anytime anyone says n tags really what they're saying is just like that's the end of it um, and you know if we wanted to make again the error stuff be uh, sort of smoother we can do this <clears throat> So that way we have a way of producing that error kind of cleanly, right? Um, and I think that's all kind of fine. And so what I really want here is I want to be able to pass this. This is going to happen and it's going to get the category out of its private storage where it you know, remembers what it was. And everything else can happen exactly the same way as it was happening before. It's just now the asset basic category uh, needs to be stored in here along with everything else. That all seems okay. Uh, no major complaints there. But what I would like to do now is kind of push a little bit further. I know we're over time, but I kind of want to clean up a little bit of this before I end for the day so I just don't forget where I was uh, tomorrow or the things that I was in the middle of doing. So if I go look at this, uh, you know, I've got this n tags call, right? Um, in here, all the people who are calling that n tags call, really all they need to do now, instead of the like uh, result stuff or any of this import body or any of that, right? Uh, they don't really need to be doing that anymore. They just need to be able to call uh, Well, you know what? That's not entirely true either. So this is a little bit more complicated than that. So each of the tags has to get duplicated out. So it actually is harder than that, meaning we are going to have to copy the tags into each of these bins, which is harder, right? Um, <clears throat> And so I'm not really sure how I want to deal with that. So the way that we were doing it before, right, is we just repeatedly parse the file name like over and over and over again, producing the same tags each time. That's what we were doing. It would probably be nicer to just do that once and then copy those tags each time, right? Because that way you don't have to constantly like repeat yourself. So yeah, that's kind of a little bit harder to see us out how we want to do that um it does mean i guess that i don't have to do this but it means things are going to be a little nastier for us um unfortunately so if you look at what's happening here right um the problem is that this needs to be able to copy an additional block of tags from somewhere, right? It needs to be able to like block copy those tags. And so if you look at what happens when you call add tag, right? We need to have some way of saying, what's the like group of tags that have to be copied into every one of these that's like coming from uh, the tag array that's in that piece of the file. And so, you know, we have a, a thing where we are going to have a for I loop here and we need to pass something in uh, that that we can use to get that to get that data. And so I guess we would need something uh, like.
So we would need something like, yeah, like this stuff. So the import grid tag, right? And we've got this tag array. It just says, here's the array of tags to copy. And so that's sort of what I think we would have to do. Meaning when we come in here, we would need to pass in a tag array to copy. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like that's, that's what we would actually need to do. Uh, and so when we come in there, we would say like, uh, you know, tag index equals append tags, first tag index. Um, tag index is less than append tags, one pass last tag index, tag index, right? And then when we do the add tag call, we would say, well, you're gonna have to get the tag first, <clears throat> Right, uh, so you got to call this, and we would look at whatever that tag index was that you told us to copy, uh, and we'd copy it. So we'd still need a way to say, here's all the tags that you're going to append to this thing. Have a party, right? Um, and I suppose that's not terrible. Like it's a little bit squinky. Um, but it's no worse than what we were doing before. And this append tags doesn't really need this type ID. Uh, so, you know, really there's sort of a tag range, um, that could be passed there. That's, that's, you know, uh, not that. And I think that's, you know, more or less this. It's this part right here. And I don't know how much I really want to make that systemic, but you know, sure. So I think that's probably fine. And I can collapse these two in a second where this is just a tag array plus a type ID, right? And that's fine, whatever. So in here, when I do the end tags, and I've got the category, got the append tags, I can append the tags on. That gives me a pretty easy way to work with this. It's really not that big a deal. So it's probably fine and off we go, right? Um, and yeah, that's just where we're at. So in here, if I wanna um, continue down that path, right? Then what this would look like is when we're passing the file name and the error string here, really we wouldn't pass it anymore. Like I said, we don't really want the error string maybe necessarily so much uh, as we want like just a tokenizer here. And we'll record our error on that. Um, and since we don't have a token in question, uh, well probably what we'll do is on our tokenizer, we'll also have the notion that generally speaking, you can issue an error without a token. You're just issuing a generic error and it will use whatever the current position of the um, tokenizer was. Um, <clears throat> and so in order to do that, what we would say is, okay, we don't have an on token in this case. So the on token is uh, just equal to the state. Well, we don't actually need to do anything at the moment, but in the future, what we'll do is we'll look at the tokenizers like line index or something, and we'd put it in there, right? And then we would call through uh, to to pass the message along, right? So we'd say like, okay, on token, you know, message, whatever, right? Now again, the problem that we're going to have here is that we need to be able to do an out f call on that. So this really wants to look like this which makes it a little bit harder for it to pass uh, through because it means you've actually got a thing that looks like this. Again, C makes this so difficult and it's just because, you know, C and C++ are not, you know, they're not good languages anymore. Well, C++ was never a good language. C used to be. Um, so anyway, if I wanna uh, be able to do that, what I need to do is take a look at the out f call, for example, you can see it here. Oh, interesting. We've got a little pound to find there. Um, and what I want to do is I want to sort of duplicate exactly what I did here. And that's why I say it's kind of annoying, right? But this is exactly what we want. Uh, we want to be able to use the VA arg list here to sort of like 
you know, plump this down one level. Uh, and so in order to do that, what I'm going to suggest is we've got an, that we put an out f in here that's uh, the same, like so. Uh, but that out f call is going to take the actual arg list here instead. So the VA list, you know, arg list here um, that, it, that we're going to use comes in so we can call this thing uh, directly. This part doesn't actually uh, happen now, right? So we do that. And then inside this out f, it actually looks like this. Something like this. So that way you can call this thing either way. You can out f if you have an arg list, or you can out f out f ah out f if you don't. Uh, and so you know I can even actually make this error thing maybe a little bit more condensed in that sense. But point being, if I want to then call an out f, I can. I can call this out f directly from either of these two things, uh, and it will allow me to put my error message onto the error stream like we were doing before. So again, in order to do that, I would need to have a way uh, of passing the file and line number here. And the file and line number, again, should come from the tokenizer. So these are really just to-dos. Um, and in fact, I guess what I could do is say, you know, like the, I guess what I'm saying is the token itself is the thing that wants to have that. So what we really want to do is say, hey, the on token file name and the on token line number, that's where we want to actually get that data from. Uh, the destination stream is going to be the tokenizer error stream. That's something that you'll create when you do it. Uh, and then from there, we're good to go. Here's the format. Uh, and the VAR list stuff is just, you know, looks like this, right? And so that gives us an easy way to make this work. With all of our existing error stream stuff. Make sense? So that's ideally what we want it to look like. Uh, and again, like here, what I'm saying is the on token doesn't really exist. So we kind of need to do that. Uh, and what we want to do is you know, looking at how outf works, it's it's funny. It doesn't even use the file nine number, so we kind of need to add that in there. Um, yeah, we'll get there. So anyway, this allows us to use an error stream and to give us the information if we uh, eventually have our tokenizer support such things. Um, so if in here we say, you know, there's a file name and uh, let's say uh, that we know what that file name is, um, then what you can see here, we're also quickly going to run to the fact that this file name wants to be ASCII's determinated, which we would prefer it wouldn't, but, you know, now we don't really have a choice. Uh, so we've got a file name and we've got a line number, which we can put in here, like so. Uh, and we'll just copy those to our tokens. And again, that's really easy to do. The tokenizer itself, uh, we would have to figure out how we're going to track that stuff. But inside get token, it's actually very easy because the token just takes um, that stuff directly from the tokenizer and there's really nothing else that we have to do, right? So we just need to track those pieces of information later, but otherwise having the tokens remember where they came in the stream is actually very easy. Um, and so that's pretty nice, right? All right. So the only other thing the tokenizer needs is it needs the actual airstream, right? It needs it needs that, um, but other than that, uh, it would work. The stream itself, it looks like, is not defined there yet. So I don't know that I want to bother defining it, so I might just forward declare it like this. Um, and let me move forwards here. So that should just work. Uh, and out f identifier not being found uh, that is really because this streaming stuff doesn't uh, pre-declare this version right and it needs
things too. All right, so let's see where we're at. Uh, this guy needs the same preamble. <clears throat> Easy enough. Uh, and you tell me you cannot find this, but uh, why can you not find it? Because it's defined in here. Oh, we're in the simple preprocessor. Uh, so that makes sense. So the simple preprocessor doesn't have the stream included, which it probably should, uh, because it's going to need that for error processing, right? I think we called that stream.h. Am I wrong about that? Uh, so I assume that the problem there is that since that's a memory backed thing, we will have to provide it with uh, a way to get the, the memory. And uh, I don't know that that's a problem. I guess the only thing that we'd have to do is provide a way for it to actually allocate things, right? Uh, and we actually already, you know, we already did this. Uh, and I don't actually know that I care about the simple preprocessor. So for now, I probably turn it off. But we already allowed that to happen inside the uh, the part the um, the PNG test bed. So having those things external is actually quite easy. I don't know that I care uh, at the moment, so I'm probably not actually going to bother with that, but I just wanted to make sure that would have worked or is reasonable enough, right? Okay, so let me go ahead and compile here. So in HHA edit, um, I don't know why I'm still including the tokenizer there either because I don't need it there either. Um, but probably just because we were using it before. And there we go. Okay, so let's see here. Um, that's all well and good. And this unfortunately needs to know the size, which I wasn't returning. I'm not sure why I wasn't returning it from both of these because I really should have. So I think that really wanted to look like that. Um, and similarly, uh, you know, this wants to look like that, right? <clears throat> I guess I'll still leave it at size. <clears throat> So uh, moving on, overloaded function differs only by return type. You're right. Is that better? There we go. Uh, and so now we're mostly just back to where we were before, where you know we've got this sort of um, annoyance where we have to figure out some way of getting this stuff to work, right? And uh, let me also real quick just make our tokenizer right recognize the fact that these errors are different than they were before. So previously we kind of had that notion, but now what we're actually doing is is uh, allowing you to give the full set there. Uh, and so I think that's all good. Yeah, that looks all good. And so now we can hook up the error stream pretty easily to the tokenizer. That'll just work uh, and it'll store everything. So we can do stuff like, yeah, saying like out of tag space and so on. <clears throat> I'm gonna leave it looking more like this. I'm gonna say that we'll insert the carriage return ourselves later as a sort of separate thing. So I don't really want that to be uh, anything weird. Now, for some reason we're getting an error on add tag here and I wanna figure out why. I'm assuming because we didn't actually type that um, or use the right type for add tags. So you can see here, uh, it wants for add tag, it wants the uh, asset tag ID and uh, an F32, but we're passing something that's just a raw value. That's because that's how we were storing them in there. We didn't type this value, we just made it be U32. Uh, so when we call add tag, we actually need that to be something that uh, is converted back to the enum. Uh, and then it should be fine, right? And, and so then you can see at that point, we're really just down to the the actual porting problem that I was saying, which is a bit 
tricky, right? Um, but I think we're okay. I don't think there's gonna be too much more to do. So instead of passing the file name and the stream errors thing, what we're doing here is we're saying, look, we're gonna pass the tokenizer so you can produce your errors okay. And then we're gonna pass uh, the import tag array that's like the append tags, right? And then when you call end tags, you're going to pass those two things along. And where I wanna pass them, I don't know. Uh, it looks like it's just where, where I happen to throw them there is fine. So it's like, looks like that. Um, and the append tags come uh, after. And that's just really all there is. So I think that's okay. Um, and, and we'll finish it this way and we'll just see if there's some other like way we can, uh, that we want to sort of change things around at all. But I think that's okay. And that way all of the errors will also get reported properly back at the line that caused the file to be imported, right? Which is the other thing that I wanted to kind of accomplish there so that we'd always know like when we hit an error because something's wrong, we'll always know definitively like who told us to do that um, because that can get really complicated once you start having these text files and stuff flying around that specify things. You really need some way to make sure that you know how like when they break you need to have a way of going like what happened, right? Uh, and so that's a pretty important part of it. Uh, so, all right, so I'm gonna say that there's an import tag array here. That's like the append tags. Uh, and then we're just gonna go ahead and, and go from there. I'm gonna put this uh, there for now. Uh, and we'll say that that's how you invoke this function. The source info, I don't remember what that actually gets used for. The answer is like nothing. So I'm gonna eliminate it for now till we know that we actually need it. Uh, and we're just gonna call this the function signature. So from there, every time we called n tags, really all we need to do is say, all right, here's those um, two pieces of information. And again, same thing here. So every time we call like an import body or whatever, instead of the previous two things, we're just passing a different two things. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, and then I think we've got ourselves set. So that really does most of the stuff that I wanted. And so now I think we're down to just like, okay, if we actually wanna call this whole thing, when we're doing our parsing, we're gonna actually have to have some state here. What I'm guessing is that we're not gonna wanna like par pass all this stuff down uh, arbitrarily. So we're probably gonna wanna do like an, you know, something like this that actually has this stuff in it. So, you know, we've got the game assets here and we've got our import source info here uh, and, you know, that sort of stuff that we can stick things on. Um, and maybe the default fields is in there too, right? So maybe that's just stored there, right? Um, and so then when we're parsing these things, we can just say like, here's the context. Uh, it is HHT, not HTT. I don't know why we're doing that. <clears throat> And so here I can just say, okay, here uh, are the, uh, the pieces of information that you need when you're gonna be parsing. And then from there, we can get that stuff out as we need it. Um, so the tag builder begin tag stuff is not gonna happen here. That was a lie. Uh, the import type uh, as well. I don't know uh, that anything needs to change there yet. But here we're gonna say like this stuff comes off of the context uh, assets. We don't pass the tag builder, that was a red herring. Uh, this right here is the result that we need. <clears throat> For the moment, we're not actually doing anything with that, but we will need to. Um, so we're just gonna pass that in there to get that. Uh, and then we need to pass, oops, that's no good. Uh, and then we need to also pass the append tags and the tokenizer and that stuff, right? So we do need to pass this and we do need to pass the, uh, the import tag array. And again, that's something we'll deal with a little bit later, uh, but we, we just wanna make sure that it all works all right, right? 
and we just want to get everything like flowing properly. Uh, so now I just need to redo the re default fields part. Again, that's now coming from the context itself. So this will uh, satisfy that. Similar similarly here, we're getting it off of the context. That's really all that needs to change there. And uh, then we just need to actually have one. <clears throat> So when we're creating this context, again, we need the assets uh, and we need the info or source info, or whatever you want to call that. And uh, source file info, asset source file info. What was that thing called? Import source info. <clears throat> And so now we can actually call the parse top level block uh, with the context that it's being asked to use. Uh, and I think we're okay. So at that point, I think we're good. Parse pieces though, I thought we got rid of that. So I think actually that doesn't really need to happen quite yet. Um, parse pieces, can I refer from string? So parse pieces is expecting something else in, let's jump there. It's expecting assets, tokenizers, append tag, the type token. So that just needs that. And so I think we're good now. Yeah. Um, so that should be all we need. It was a pretty substantial modification, obviously, but we still made it through okay. So it wasn't that bad. Uh, and then what we can do now is when we run this parse, we should now be able to uh, tomorrow make it so that as we parse each one of these we can go fetch the file that it corresponds to and update it as necessary so basically this part of the code here where we look <clears throat> excuse me uh, at the match file date stuff here this part of the code um we should be able to uh we should be able to make that do exactly what we needed, right? That should be all we need. And furthermore, I don't know that we actually need the getter create asset source file thing to be stable anymore, but yeah, it's sort of a separate issue. Um, so anyway, this should be fine and we can get rid of this to do as well. I'm gonna stop there because we've done enough. I'll go to a brief Q and A. I think we've kind of done all of the munging we need to port everything over to the way we were doing it. Oh, sorry, I should say from the way we were doing it to the way we're going to do it. Um, and that wasn't too bad. It was a little squinky, but it seems reasonable. Um, and so we'll, we'll deal with all the bugs tomorrow. Uh, and then hopefully that will, that will allow us to be importing via text now instead. What are the flaws of converting a decimal floating point number to a binary equivalent by first parsing the number and converting it to a regular integer, ignoring the decimal point, then using the parsed number as the mantissa and an accumulated value for the exponent for the floating point number? So let me just make sure I understand what you're asking. You're saying if you were to parse the number as a decimal, and then you are going to try and figure out a way to store that number 
Well, I mean, the, the, I guess the first thing I'd say is you haven't really said how you were going to do the exponent part of that. Because I guess to state the obvious, the exponent is also binary. It's not a power of 10, right? So the decimal mantissa isn't the mantissa, and it's not only not the mantissa, it's not related to the mantissa, right? Because the exponent that you have to remove in order to create the mantissa is itself a binary exponent. It's a power of two, not a power of 10. Does that help answer the question? Maybe? So I'm not sure it really buys you all that much to do what you're saying. It seems like it's, it doesn't really help solve the problem. You're still left with exactly the same problem, which is converting base 10 to base two. Tell me if I'm understanding your correct question correctly, though, because I may not be understanding what you're asking. I mean, what you might be asking is, what if I created a giant number of storage? So I use like big num, so I can store as many bits as I want. And then I convert a, decim a, a binary number with the decimal point removed into just the, a giant binary, binary number, right? It could be thousands of bits long. Then I counted how many of those that I have and I truncate them at the point where I can store my exponent and then I use the rest of the mantissa. If that's what you're asking, then sure, uh, I think that works because at the end of the day, the binary conversion has now happened prior to needing anything fractional. But by that point, you've already built like, you've had to build like big num, right? To give you your, uh, it, it seems like really, really inefficient, right? So if you're asking how to, if you're asking, can I do that without the big num? No, because you would run out of bits immediately right? Um, even a very small floating point number by floating point standards is way bigger than 4 billion, right? Floating point numbers can represent, you know, hundreds of billions if they want to. Uh, so that might be one way to just to think about it too. I don't know. Let me know if this is helping. I don't know if that's help if that's answering what your question is. What do I think about WebAssembly? Um, I don't understand the point of it, I guess. Like, I don't know why they didn't just define an executable format or just use one that already exists, <clears throat> you know? Um, I mean, if you want an assembly language, just pick one, you know, uh, go, go pick like an open risk or something and then remove the parts that you think are security issues and then use it. I don't know why they had thought that what the world needed was like another assembly language like thing that still is in text format for no discernible reason that is also not built on any existing proofed machine code I, it's it i have no idea web standards are nuts they seem to be made in ways that literally don't leverage any historical things we've learned and i i it i don't know um so yeah is it good that we have a thing eventually that maybe will allow us to write compiled code on the web easier sure are they doing a good job no
So I don't know. Um, I guess that's what I would say. So I don't know if web is, assembly is still text. Maybe they now have a binary version of it, which is at least an improvement. Um, but I don't know if that actually works yet or if they're doing that. I have no idea. Like most things, I'm sure it will be a lot like CSS. They've decided to reinvent the wheel, which I'm not opposed to if you understand the problems of the wheel and you're going to build a better one. A lot of times what web standards seem to be is reinventing the wheel without ever knowing what a wheel was or how it works. And then you end up with like this weird blobby square thing and you're like, look at how good I did. And you're like, we already had things that were pretty circular. What have you done? You know? WebAssembly didn't always have a binary format unless I'm mistaken. WebAssembly used to actually just be rules about how you would interpret JavaScript code to generate assembly. There was no format at all, actually. It was just a convention for JavaScript. It did not have a binary format, unless I'm wrong about that. Uh, that's a new thing. The text format, like, yeah, like ASM.js, that thing. That's what I'm talking about. I guess if you're talking about WebAssembly is not ASM.js or like that's not part of the lineage or whatever, then okay. I tend to think of all of those things as exactly the same, if that makes sense. Somebody took my name. How would you convince a seasoned object-oriented programmer on, of the merits of not using it? Um, I don't generally do that. Uh, I don't try to convince people not to program in ways they want to program. They should just go do it. Um, it's usually just not worth my time uh, to try and talk to people about stuff like that. If they don't want to do something some way, they shouldn't. Like, You know what I mean? Have you ever read any of the art of computer programming? You mean by Knuth the, or Knuth, or I don't know how you pronounce his name, but uh, yes, I have, but I don't have a copy, so I haven't read much. I've read it like from other people's bookshelves. I've read parts of it, but um, it's obviously very large, so I've never read the bulk of it. Why don't you use switch in the while parsing tokenizer loop? Um, this one, I guess it depends on which loop you're talking about. Um, there's more than one of those. And the reason why I don't use switch here is because I wanted to use break and it was not very many token types. The reason why I don't use switch here is because you can't switch on strings. Right, you have to switch on on constant values. <clears throat> XX the big fox XX. Can you explain a bit more what Windows considers UTF-16? I see it mentioned plenty of times on MSDN, but usually it just means WKRT, not actual UTF-16 with surrogates. Uh, no, the answer is I can't explain more because I have no idea. I've never really looked hard at what Windows tries to do with what you pass it for um, non-ANSI encoded text, basically. So I know that they support some kind of two-byte character encoding. I know that it is mostly UTF-16, but in terms of the edge cases, uh, I don't know what they do. And thankfully, my job never really depends on that. 
my sort of vague cursory understanding is that they're trying to kind of move towards UTF-8 slowly. So hopefully we won't have to care much eventually because Windows 10 will just be like the rest of the world and work on UTF-8. But at the moment, no, I really couldn't tell you. Uh, the UTF-16 that is in Windows originally that they when they first did it there really wasn't much of a unicode standard so it is definitely possible slash likely that there's a lot of cruft there but it's just not something i interface with so i don't know like some parts of windows i've worked with a lot and so i know all the little weird like ins and outs i don't know anything about the corner cases of windows's utf-16 support Has the intentionally deliberate pace for Handmade Hero helped you in your day job at all as a reminder, refresher, or is it always just tedious to program in this fashion after all these years? Um, it hasn't helped me in that way at all. It's helped me a little bit because, you know, sometimes I'll be doing stuff on stream. Well, even like today, like someone was saying that <clears throat> there's a binary thing for WebAssembly, right? Like. You know, I don't follow things like that much. So when we talk about things on stream, I'm likely to learn something because someone on the chat's likely to know something about it that I don't know. And so I usually learn stuff like that on the stream where it's just like information that's out there uh, that I don't follow. Programming wise, um, I always kind of enjoy programming. So I always like doing Handmade Hero. The only thing I don't necessarily enjoy is a lot of the things on Handmade Hero I've kind of like already solved. Like I already have a tokenizer and I already have error streams and all that, that sort of stuff. And so sometimes it's a little frustrating because like, well, I'm going to have to implement this again and it's not going to be as good as the one that I have that I normally use because that one's had more time and energy put into it. And it was designed exactly the way I want because I designed it, right? So uh, sometimes it's a little unfortunate because I'm like, oh, you know, it's a separate code base and it doesn't have all the fancy bells and whistles maybe or something, right? But at the same time, I always do think it's worth practicing your low-level programming chops. And so writing something a second time or a third time or a tenth time even is still good practice for a systems programmer. So I don't mind. And once in a while, I hit upon something I hadn't thought of in my own code. And that's like, oh, I'll remember that, you know? Just saw your talk on Papers I Love, or whatever they call it. Super Impressed has brought me back to Handmade Hero. Oh, well, I'm glad you liked it. Um, it was a fun lecture. It was unusual because it was a really like high-level lecture. Um, but uh, I also, it, like it was a kind of a weird audience uh, to give it to, but like, I don't know, it seemed all right. And uh, I'd never really been asked to talk about something from that point of view before, where it was like, where have you like extended research work in some way that ended up being interesting? And so that was fun. I'm not putting a party hat on Molly. That's just mean. I don't like it when people dress cats up because cats don't like to be dressed. Maybe in the rare circumstance where you have a cat who does like to be dressed up, okay. But most cats don't like having things around their collar or on their head definitely not on their paws they hate that in my experience um all right i think we're done with questions i say there we go whoa what happened there we got a, there's like a black, out, I, don't, I don't know what's going on there. We don't really need this anymore anyway. We kind of finished that. Well, I don't know what happened there, but we'll just hide it. All right. Thank you everyone for joining me this episode of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you as always. If you would like to follow along the series at home, you can always pre-order the game on handmadehero.org and it comes with a source code so you can play around with it. 
Maybe you'd like to beat me to the punch and port the asset port um, handling code over to the new uh, format. Certainly got a chance to do that tonight because uh, I won't finish it up till tomorrow. So if you want to give that a shot, go for it. Uh, other than that, I'll be back here tomorrow to do that finishing up. Uh, and I hope to see you back here for that. Same time, same place. Till then, well, same time, same place, unless Seattle's power goes out, which, you know, we're in a giant snowstorm here. So far, so good. Assuming we have power, I'll see you tomorrow. Until then, have fun programming. See you on the internet. Take it easy, everybody.